How do we keep one another safe without relying on police? What if prison and punishment aren't the best or even the most effective response to violence, harm, and hurt? Today's guests say we can't hurt or heal alone. We can only hurt or heal in relationship. Conveniently, they have pulled together a toolkit on how to do that. In fact, in their new book, Beyond Survival, Strategies and Stories from the Transformative Justice Movement, they've gathered insights from people who are doing that work every day on front lines. The tools and experiences they share don't just relate to addressing violence, but also preventing it. And they might just inspire you to get involved yourself. Co-editors Ejeris Dixon and Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samarasina are joining me with a how-to on transformative justice next. This is the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. So first, uh, Jeris and Leah joining us from Seattle. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And while we're going to be talking about trauma and violence and yes. fear and surviving and getting yes. beyond it and making health, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling incredibly stressed. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. yes. TV mm -hmm. is the least of it. We're dealing with a pandemic. We're dealing with an out of control government. Yes. We're dealing with lack of transparency. Yes sometimes feels like lack of community, and now social distancing is supposed to be good for us. What's your top line advice to somebody like me who's like, I don't even know if I want to have this conversation in the midst of everything else? I think there's both always a right time and, and it's always difficult. So the, the truth that I would see around um, so many of the communities that are represented in Beyond Survival, so many of us come from places where, whether it's pandemic, whether it's, um, Trump's kind of neo-fascist America, we, we're, we've been under threat most of our lives. So what that also means is that what we're doing in this book is that we're documenting resilience and we're documenting this skill set of survival and that genius. So I, I would say that we're social distancing. We're taking the time. This is actually a great time to skill build. This is a great time to do relationship building with the people nearest to you. People are talking about going to talk to your neighbors and saying, and just reminding them that you're still there. I live alone. I have a friend who lives alone and um, who started to feel sick yesterday. And I said to him, I need you to tell me how you're doing every day. Mm. I need us to write a plan together. I learned that both out of life, but I learned that also because I come from a community of queer and trans people of color where we have been figuring out how to keep ourselves safe most of our lives. So Leah, is there anything you would add to that beautiful response from Ajiris? <laughs> Hi, well, first of all, I think you both are beautiful. Second of all, um, I would add that I think specifically disabled communities, particularly disabled black and brown communities, have been planning these skills for a long time. And a lot of us are saying that a lot of the strategies that are being suggested right now around, and the realities of having to stay home, having to work online, having to build together to make sure that we have what we need, are strategies that sick and disabled communities are really well versed in. So I would ask that, I would say that if you're able-bodied and this is new for you, really look to what disability justice folks have been doing for a long time, because we know how to do care collectives. We know everything about where you can order stuff online and get delivered at home. And there's so many instances of wonderful solidarity happening in Seattle, which is ground central right now, that I'm actually really proud to be here. When we say transformative justice, what do we? Mean? What do you mean, Ajiris? I like to keep it simple. How do we create safety without relying on police and prisons? Period. Does that mean that you never call a cop? I I wouldn't say. I think many people experience violence at the hands of the police and at the hands of the state. So, I used to do a workshop with people that would think about even harm reduction. So there are times where. There's a heart attack. There are time, but there's there are still many options. There are private ambulances. There are first aid skills that we can build. But the idea is how do we create safety without police and prisons? Because we want to recognize that while many people in society are often told that that's the key to safety, um, low-income people, black people, 
um, queer and trans people, disabled people, so many of us. Undocumented, uh, undocumented people. people, right? I, I have generations of strategies in my family around creating safety that don't involve policing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because the police are also a threat. Leah? Everything that Adair said, I would also say that I believe in transformative justice as harm reduction. Um, I think that sometimes in some movement spaces, and this is part of why we did the book, um, people have an idea that transformative justice means one thing. It means, you know, sitting with someone who's caused harm for years, being like, okay, we're going to figure out why you did this and transform it. And I believe in those strategies. But I also believe in transformative justice is going up to the guy who's hassling a woman at my bus stop and saying, hey, you need to leave her alone. You know, or telling somebody who's being abusive and threatening their ex-partner, you need to stop posting on Facebook. We've got friends here. Or I don't even know this person, but she reached out to me and I care about her. I think that there are many, many, many steps, small and large, that we can take towards creating this world without prisons and that everybody can play a part, you know, no matter what that part looks like. There's a lot in wrapped up in what we just talked about. Yeah. But it's not like we're talking about a boycott strategy per se. No. We can get there, that we perhaps can do better than the institutions. We know we can yep. do better than the institutions we've built so far. Yep. But just to start with the reason somebody might not, for them, make the decision to call a police person or call, yep. dial 911. You have a lot of examples in the book. You want to tell some? Sure. So I used to work at the Audrey Lord Project years ago. And LGBT center, <laughs> predominantly for people of color. Yes, and in central Brooklyn. and. We had noticed around the early 2000s that there was a rise in violence. Um, people were either experiencing violence at parties or on their way home. So, th so the Audrey Lord Project has the Safe Party Toolkit in there, which is really built from strategies that people use to secure demonstrations and actions. And instead, how do you apply that to a party space? How do you think about a space where people can still enjoy themselves, but you can intervene in violence? How do you think about a way that people can get home? So that's one of the many examples. And just to tease that out, to put a point on it, why would you want to be doing it yourself and not just paste the 911 number loudly on the, on the wall? Well, so um, to give a, a very concrete example, there was a party that was mostly black lesbians and um, especially like masculine of center lesbians. They, they, um, they saw all, all of the folks who were her masculine as threats. So it wasn't, um, so if two people were having an argument, it, it's not like we have natural de-escalators in our police. It's not like they say, what's going on? What do you need? How do we help resolve this? No, it was two people in handcuffs and off, and, and, and it was usually just a presumption of like gender and masculinity as violence, black people as inherently violent. There are all of these societal tropes that don't bring us to safety, but that just criminalize so many of our identities. So the reason that we need to keep ourselves safe is because uh, I got a call once from a black gay man who was attacked on his way home. He grabbed a garbage can and he defended himself with this garbage can. He was still attacked. Um, he didn't even call 911 himself. 911 was called, the ambulance came. He actually ended up in the precinct. He did not get medical care and was attacked again. Mm. And, and, and so he was like, what can you all do mm. for me? So that's just an example of why and what some of the strategies can look like. Yeah, we've seen from the Say Her Name campaigns that we've covered often on this program that it is often a family member calling for help. Oh, yes. And an under-resourced society that sends untrained cops. Yes. And those cops in the end often say, I felt threatened, I was scared, I was, you know, their, their language is very subjective. Yes. And their reaction is often very different to a woman of color having a bad day, a problem with her meds, whatever, yes. than it would be for a comparable white person. Yes. Um, it reminds me of the, there was the murder of a young black man called Kyle Coppin. He was actually in the building where I live now. I had lived a couple, uh, a couple of blocks away. He and his mom got into an argument uh, and she called 911 seeking support. Uh, at some point, they, uh, the police saw him with a hairbrush raised, assumed it was a weapon, and shot him, right? So this is, um, and there's a lot of folks, uh, I would think of, um, like, Trans Lifeline is, is talking in the book about how they are navigating issues of suicide without relying on the police. There are organizations that are organizing in New York City 
who are thinking about how do we have an alternative number, an alternative institution that we can call for um, people when they are in kind of like mental health yeah. distress. So it's necessary because we have seeded, or as a society, we have assumed that um, issues of de-escalation, understanding and navigating um, people who are needing support is the role of the police. And when, when that doesn't make sense at all, and when there is so much structural violence that happens at the hands of the police. So Leah, coming to you, it's also true that many stories in your book re relate to in-relationship violence. Um, mm -hmm. You have your own story about how you got yeah. into this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when people have been asking us, how did you get into this work? Why is it successful? Um, my first response is always like, the way that I got into transformative justice is also why I would say that it's worth it because without it, I wouldn't be alive. Um, you know, like many, many people who are in this book, I got brought into it because I was a survivor who could not go to the police. Um, my ex-partner, who was physically abusive, was a non-binary queer person of color who'd already done prison time and who both threatened me with a lot of violence if I ever called the cops and um, was my immigration sponsor. Um, this is going back 20 years. Um, so the police were not an option. And there are many people who have much less privilege than I do who are in similar situations where because of the interlocking facets of immigration, the police, et cetera, they can't call the people who are supposed to help them. Um, so before transformative justice was a word that I'd ever heard, I had like a lot of people, I had a group of my young femme of color friends who were like, okay, Every place, every time we go out, we're going to go into the club or go into the meeting first and see if he's in there. And then we're going to come out and talk to you and see what you need. And we'll either go in and ask him to leave or we'll go in with you so you're supported. And that supported me over a 10-year period of sharing a really small community with that person where I knew because I tried. We, we all tried. He was not willing to face what he'd done and take accountability. But he could see that I wasn't alone. And that kept me safe, that kept me alive, that continues to keep me alive. And there are a million different examples of that kind of strategy in this book and other spaces. Um, I know that it can be, feel really overwhelming to replace the entire prison industrial complex, especially in a situation where someone might be facing immediate threat of harm or death. But there are a lot of examples in this book where it really starts with one other person stepping up and being like, hey, I'm there with you. Um, I wanted to particularly shout out um, some of the sex work organizers like Monica Foster and Elaine Lamb, who are from communities that really can't call the police. And Elaine Lamb of the Migrant Sex Workers Network has these amazing stories of being in her home country and um, organizing with other sex workers who are facing violence from clients and doing things like they're like, yeah, we um, created, we, we bought video equipment so that it could, we could have secret video cameras in workspaces and then we could point it to clients who are getting violent and saying, hey, do you want to be on camera? Um, there are all these ways they organize without the police, um, from teaching people how to memorize what you know, violent clients look like so that word could go out to um, sex workers working with people in their neighborhood, including folks who are you know, doing street-based work, including drug dealing, to be like, hey, this is somebody who's a problem. Like, Watch out for them. Um, when we're in situations without a lot of systemic power, it can look like we don't have options, but actually we're always innovating and we're always creating stuff at the margins that can work anywhere. So that's one aspect of this work and one aspect of the book. People at the margins have reasons not to call the police. The other aspect of this book is maybe punishment, incarceration, criminalization, right. sending people away for a long time isn't the best way to address violence in our society for anyone. Right. When you watch Harvey Weinstein, for example, mm -hmm. get sent away for 23 years, mm -hmm. there's a part of me that says, right, mm -hmm. and a relief, and some women were believed. Yeah. But there's another part of me that says, okay, so what changes so that this doesn't happen again? And that's a big part of what's in here, too. I've been thinking about that a lot, because um, both the Me Too movement and the transformative justice movement have been particularly active in the last couple of years, and um, how prison takes Harvey Weinstein away, right? But it, it doesn't change that behavior. Um, it doesn't necessarily heal someone, right? It doesn't transform the skill set. So I, I recently came out with a toolkit to actually think about what are the steps that we can take around creating 
more education based on consent, intervening early on, finding ways to that people can report information to each other and address violence without um, without it getting to the point where people know that somebody has been harming someone, has been harming hundreds of people or many, many people, and there's there are these secrets. What we what we know about what happens, like people want to experience violence in prison, and sometimes people end up um, more traumatized, more like the idea that someone comes out of prison um, and is transformed or less harmful uh, is is really a fallacy. Yeah. That's not what that institution is for. I would just add, this is something that's pretty basic, but it really bears saying something like 95 percent, 97 percent of survivors of violence um, can't even get a court date if they wanted to. There are so many cases of people who are survivors of incest, rape, you know, domestic violence, who basically get told they're not good victims, right? So they can't use the system or who are, don't have the money to go to court or who are cut out of court by statutes of limitation. Um, I'm one of many childhood sexual abuse survivors who's never thought about taking my parents to court because I know that my mom, who is my perpetrator, is a nice white lady and it would never even make it to pretrial. Right. So I think that I understand often when people are like, you want to, what are you saying? Prisons don't work. What are we going to do with them? There's a fear that we're saying that we're going to just hold rapist hands and give them a cookie. And that's not what we're saying, but we're saying that prison doesn't actually work to stop rape or abuse or violence, period. So we need something else. We need consequences. And we also need resources that will work, that are not led by the survivors of the people who are harmed, um, by which I mean they don't, that the survivors shouldn't have to do the work. But there needs to be stuff out there that will sit with people who are doing horrible, violent behavior and be like, OK, we're going to change this. So what, so what does it involve? I mean, yeah. you've got this nice toolkit. Uh -huh. Everyone is going to go away and read it. But give them a few hints. <laughs> well, a few hints, if I could jump yeah, in. Yeah. I mean, this okay, is, yeah. yeah, no, so, um, you know, um, Generation Five. Um, they have a. We've got a segment from their Transforming Childhood Sexual Abuse um, Toolkit in the book, and they talk about the really. I mean, this is stuff that's very difficult to find any information about. They talk about okay, so people who sexually abuse kids. What are the resources out there that are intervening with those perpetrators? And they have really interesting information about programs in Europe where they're like, okay, so in the States, there's nothing like this, right? If you call and you say, I think I'm at risk of losing it and doing something harmful, you know, there's nothing, there's no place you can call. Mm. But I believe in Amsterdam, there's a program where they're like, we set up a hotline for people who are like, I'm worried that I have pedophilic urges. And they saw a really dramatic drop in the cases of those people perpetrated, right? So there's that. Um, there's the centers, the, the circles of, of accountability and support program in Canada that's done similar with people who are released from prison for doing CSA perpetration. That's like, we're going to sit with you and give you a relationship and not just throw you in the garbage, but we're also going to keep an eye on you to be like, look, are you worried that you're going to mess up and do something harmful? Um, those are just two examples. I would also really shout out, there's so much preventative work that is highlighted in the book. Can but anyone, I'm going to step back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can anyone do this? And CSA has to just say child sexual abuse. Yeah. I think anyone right. can and everyone has to. That's that's where where I would think so. You don't have to be an expert? You don't have to have a degree? You don't have to. No, if we waited for that. <laughs> if we And no, I think practice matters. Learning, le learning different types of skills around um, how to how to receive someone who's um, disclosed to you that they've experienced violence, how to receive someone who's disclosed to you that they have um, harmed somebody. Those are important skills to build, but some of that is also very much practice-based. I think about uh, the, Bay Area, the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective um, has a piece in the book about pod mapping, right? Where it's really about, right? I really wanted you to talk about that because we do, and they redress it in the article where they say, you know, we talk a lot about the community and people think they have a community. Yeah. But right. then. But, but then instead people were realizing, oh, I don't know actually who I would call or who I would rely on if something happened to me or if I harmed someone. So it's this process where you kind of um, define who the people you would go to are. And what define I Define meaning write it down with their phone number. Right, and what's, what I love about their model is that then they, people actually come to the meeting with their pot. Right? They go and have a training around what does transformative justice mm. mean? What would we do? What do you need? What, and because um, Miriam Kaba often says, people transform in relationship. 
right? People transform in relationship with each other. So it's not only something that everyone can do, but everyone has to. Most of us are far more likely, right? There are people who know my survivor stories, um, but authorities do not, yeah. right? So more often than not, we are called, we are the ones who, who need to intervene. We are the ones who feel guilty at night when we did not. Yeah. We're the, we are the people that if, if, if and when I cause harm, like I will listen to someone in my community or somebody in my, that it's in relationship with me, somebody in my pod, right? Um, those are the people who are most likely to change. And um, we would, I've done a lot of work where people are thinking about this person. I've done a lot of work around strangers, right? And you have to start to even map those relationships. Okay, well, I saw this person at the store. Maybe the store owner knows them. Maybe the store owner then can let, let us know who their re relative is. And because the, the piece is, is that people do transform um, in accountability with other people that know them. People don't transform as much in a vacuum. So back up. You call up your the person who's being violent towards you and or to your friend or someone in your pod and say, we need to talk? Um, mm -hmm. You can. <laughs> you can. So, off, I mean, the last, uh, the last process or a current process that I'm, I'm working on, I got an email from a friend about a friend of mine that was like, the, this thing happened. And I'm wondering um, if you would be willing to help hold your friend accountable. And, and, that's, and that's how it started. Mm. That's literally, um, I've, I've gotten phone, I've, I got, I've gotten calls from people I've worked with. Yeah. And it, one of the essays in the book that I think must come up a lot is somebody's asked to be part of a coalition mm -hmm. with a group that hasn't right. addressed the abuse by mm -hmm. somebody in that group. Yeah. And they have mm -hmm. to decide what's the priority mm -hmm. for me, being part of this coalition about some important issue or addressing this, which is probably going to have ramifications down the road. L Leah, what does it take actually to do this work? I mean, you've already, you're, you're dealing with your own situation, your own, everyone is dealing with their own challenges, um, mm -hmm. our own survival needs, uh, particularly in this period of stress, but all the time, everyone's in stress. This is taking on a very big deal, isn't it? Trying to make your community, your pod safe, being on call. <laughs> well, I was gonna joke and say a strong stomach, but I would also say, really think about what your boundaries are. You know, know that you're gonna discover them through doing this work. I think part of the reason why Jaris and I and the contributors in the book really stress that there are so many, that yes, we all have to do this work and there are so many different roles to play, is that I think when it just falls on one or two people, that's a huge recipe for burnout, right? But there are many different roles that folks can play in terms of like, you know, if you're tired and you wanna bring food to the meeting, great. If you want to if you want to sit with someone who's perpetrated harm and you have those skills, awesome. If you don't want to do that, you can work with the survivor. Um, if you want to do research, that's important. So I think really thinking about what role you want to play, what your skills are, what you're good at, and not feeling like you have to say yes to everything. Um, I'm thinking about a phrase I've heard um, actually in the context of housework, which is um, nobody has to do everything, but everybody has to do something. And I think that when we move towards a role of more and more people doing one dish, as it were, in a transformative justice process, it makes it more possible to do the work of remaking the entire world. How do you know when you've been successful, Ajiris? Um, I, I know that I've been successful, or I, I, can, tell you, I can tell you a short story. Okay, sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, of, of something that I realized. So I, um, there was a point where we were reaching out to store owners when I was doing this work um, more actively. And uh, I had said to a store owner, would you be willing to join this neighborhood project where if somebody um, is experiencing violence, they could come into your store? And she was like, I don't know. I don't know if that's me. And we'd had this conversation. I kind of let it go. I was like, you know, maybe I'll stop by. And um, she, she called me up the next week. And um, she was like, I did it. And I was like, you did it. <laughs> and she was like, I was a safe space. And I, she, and I was like, okay, great, tell me about it. And she was like, there was a young woman. She was, um, I could tell she was being chased. And this, uh, the woman I was talking to, the store owner, she ran a coffee shop. Mm. I let her in the coffee shop. I locked the door, I gave her tea, and I helped her call her parents. Mm. And so I think there's a piece around, if we locate success 
in the idea that we have eradicated all forms of violence, then I don't. I actually don't think that that's where we get. Yeah. Right. If we locate success in the fact that we have empowered and supported people to intervene when they see something is wrong, to feel like that it's not only their responsibility but they're equipped, I think that's success. It's beautiful. You end the book by, with a conversation about what's hard in this work and also what's great. Um, we've heard quite a lot about what's hard. What about what's great in it, Leah? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that for I, speaking as a survivor, I can say that for so many survivors, our experience of dealing with the violence and abuse that we have survived is that we're really alone in it and that the community just kind of goes, oh, I don't know what to do and looks the other way. And I think the thing that's the greatest for me about doing this work is being part of work where at the end of the day, the survivor's like, wait, I wasn't alone. And I wasn't just kind of like abandoned by my community. And I actually had help in creating a just, safe, vibrant, amazing life. Want to add anything to that? Um, what's great for me is going and meeting up with people. Sometimes I even don't remember what I helped with and having them take me aside and say, do you remember when I called you um, when mm -hmm. I was scared to get home? Beautiful. Thank you both. I think with the two of you and all the people in this book, we can be a public that creates public health and welfare. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. There's Appreciate more information you. about the book and another interview I was lucky enough to do with Leah earlier in this program at our website. Check it out.